Here on the Homebrew Challenge, I've been brewing my way through various different IPAs, but I think if there was just one IPA style that really everybody associates with Indian Pale Ale, it would be Brown IPA. Right? My name is Martin Keane and thank you for joining me on the Homebrew Challenge where I'm brewing 99 beers in 99 weeks and today's brown IPA is going to be fermented right here in this corny cake which is something I've done before but then I am going to cold crash and carbonate the beer in this corny cake which is also something I've done before then I am going to use this very same vessel to serve the beer as well, which, well, that's something new. Yeah, 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 it's just a dark. Now, if you're anything like me, you might not be all that familiar with the style of American Brown IPA. Barkeep, I'd like a pint of only your finest Brown IPA, please. It's actually quite a, a new style in name. It was only added in 2015 to the BJCP guidelines as Brown IPA. Prior to that, it was known as Texas Brown Ale. But what this beer is supposed to be is a combination of American IPA and the hoppiness that you get from that, with all of that malty richness that you'd get from an American Brown Ale. So I have heated up my strike water here. I'm going to be brewing this at 152 Fahrenheit, so let's get the grain into the basket. And I'm brewing here a 2.5 gallon batch, which is yeah, what I've been doing mainly uh, with most of my styles, although I have been sneaking in a few 5 gallon beer styles for those that I know that I really, really like. But look, I have so many beers, so this one's 2.5 gallons. Oh, I need the, need the whisk. I'm going to be mashing in here for about an hour, just keeping an eye on the original gravity. But um, this should be a fairly straightforward mash, I think. Got a, a few dark grains in here, which certainly helps balance out the pH. Okay, let's get this rolling. Now the grain bill is where we get to address the multi side of this beer. So in my grain bill, well, I'm building an original gravity of 1066, so around a 6.7% beer, and my primary base malt at 82% is going to be pale two row malt. Now to that, I am adding caramel 20 and carapils, both at 7%, and that should get me the bready and sweet characteristics that we want from this beer. Now we also want to get some darker flavors as well, not, not roasted, but things like toffee or nutty. Uh, to that end, I'm using chocolate malt at 350 SRM. I'm adding that in at 4% and that will also help address the color of this beer as well, which it being a brown ale, we would quite like to be brown. Check out the color on this thing, it's looking great. So I am a bit of a fan of fermenting in corny kegs. In fact, I know brewers that just ferment everything in a keg. And there are a lot of advantages. The first one being, well, you probably have a few of these lying around, so that's the availability advantage. Um, also, they're nice and compact, so this will easily fit into like a chest freezer if you just have a little bit of room so you can handle temperature control really easily. Um, also, you can pressure ferment in here because obviously these kegs can hold pressure. And you can also do completely closed transfers. So once the fermentation is done, you can transfer into a serving keg completely closed so you're not going to expose any of the beer to oxygen. You don't need to lift the top up here. You can just put some pressure in and send the beer into the other keg. Now, that's how I have done fermentation in kegs up until now. But I'm gonna skip that step of transferring to a serving keg and I'm gonna make the, my, my fermentation keg 
also my serving keg. Now to do that, I need a way to avoid all of the trube that's gonna be at the bottom of this keg at the end of fermentation. I don't really want to be sucking all of that up. And the way that I'm going to do that is, well, I'm gonna be a little bit inspired from another fermenter that I use, which is a Firmzilla. So here is one of those. Now the, the Firmzilla here has a floating dip tube. And what that does is, um, well, l let me show you. So as I'm adding in water in here, the little ball on the end of my floating dip tube is floating on the top of the water. And what that means is that this floating dip tube is going to take any liquid that's on the top of my fermenter, not the stuff at the bottom. I'm just gonna shut, shut the water off. So what that means is that when I start to pull up liquid through this tubing, I'm getting the beer that's on the top, the highest level beer in this fermenter, not the stuff that's on the bottom. And considering the bottom is gonna be where the trube is, I want the clear beer from the top. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to install a floating dip tube in my corny keg. So if I open this one up, you can see there's a dip tube that runs all the way to the bottom. Actually, this one doesn't run quite all the way to the bottom because I clipped it so that when I'm transferring from my fermentation keg into my serving keg, it's not gonna pull the worst of the true that's at the bottom of the keg. But even so, I don't know if clipping this is gonna be sufficient to ensure that I'm really getting the clearest beer when I'm serving out of a keg that is full of trube. So that is one thing that you could do is just snip this uh, an inch off, which is what I've done here, serve through here. Maybe the first point or two is gonna be a bit cloudy, then after that, eh, maybe it's gonna be okay. But I do like this idea of using a floating dip tube instead. Now the dip tube that I have here, well, how am I gonna install this in place of this guy? Uh, well, first of all, this doesn't reach to the bottom. It's not long enough. And secondly, I need a way to connect to the, the liquid outpost. There's a good hack for that and that is to steal a gas post from another keg. What I'm gonna do is just use this part of the gas post and I'm going to connect it to my silicon tubing and then that way I can insert this in that hole there into the keg. So the only other thing I need to do is to cut a piece of silicon tubing that is actually long enough for this ball to really touch the bottom of the keg. So I've got a new piece of silicon tubing here. This is one quarter inch ID, I think hmm, about there. Let's give that a try. See how this looks. Yeah, that looks much better. The only tricky bit I think is going to be getting this into here uh, through, <laughs> through this. So uh, hmm, let's see. Aha, got it, got it. Okay, now I have a floating dip tube in here. My heart's been ripped wide open So many mixed emotions It's like I finally noticed I've been set free For the hops for this beer, I'm using two hops kind of interchangeably. So I'm gonna start off with Bravo which is my bittering hop. Now you don't need very much of this. This is gonna be 14 or 15 alpha acids. So you don't need very much. I'm putting in, in a five gallon batch, you'd put in half an ounce. And with 15 minutes to go for aroma, I am combining Bravo again with Falconer's Flight. Falconer's Flight is a hop that I've used before with pale ales. It is tropical, fruity. Um, and I thought it'd be kind of interesting to put into this American um, brown IPA. And then at flame out, I'm going to take the rest of my Falconer's Flight and I'm gonna add that in as my aroma hop. Well, it looks like the boil is already running. So let's get the bittering hop in first of all.
I've chilled the beer about as much as I can with my groundwater now. And then I added some star sand into this keg and then just took the output of the, uh, the plate chiller here, the water that was passing through it, and used that to sanitize this thing. I also just added a little bit of pressure to it. So I want to test that this floating dip tube is gonna work. So let me just uh, see if I can get some star sand out of this thing. Let's see if anything comes out. Hey, all right, so that's working. So now what I'm gonna do is take the star sand and get it out. And now fill this thing with beer. Okay, that's done. I'm now going to throw a tilt wireless hydrometer into here as well. And yes, these tilts, they use Bluetooth and they are still able to communicate even when they're in a, a keg of beer. And then put the lid on. For the blow off part of this assembly, I'm going to use a growler filled with some of this star sand. And then I've just got a bit of tubing with a, a gas post on it. I'll put it into here. And then this will just go in and into here. And then the bubbles will uh, go through here as an airlock. Uh, there is only one thing missing, and that's the yeast. Here it is. For this one, I'm using Y Yeast 1056 American Ale. This is a, just a great all around yeast and I think it works very well in brown ales and also in IPAs, so it seems like a, a good candidate. This beer is currently a little bit warm, so I'm just gonna dump this in my chest freezer, chill it down to about 68 Fahrenheit or 20 Celsius, then I'll be adding the yeast and letting it ferment in the keg. And I will come back when that's done and we'll take a look at serving out of one of these things. It's been about four weeks. The beer has been fermenting, cold crashed. It's ready now for me to try. So I've just added 10 PSI of pressure to this thing. And uh, now let's see how clear the beer is that comes out. I'm just gonna use this little picnic tap here. All right, here we go. Fizzy. Well, I think what's happened here is really a problem with the uh, burst carving that I gave this rather than the floating dip tube. Um, I wasn't really sure what to do about carbonation with this, it being in the keg this whole time. So um, I just cold crashed in the keg, then I released whatever pressure built up then, um, and then force carbonated at 30 psi for a few days after that but I suspect when I was cold crashing uh, I was building up quite a lot of pressure then and carbonating the beer at that point and then I carbonated it a second time which has resulted in this but the part that's beer it looks pretty good you're looking quite good now it's really quite crazy to think that I'm about to drink something that is just sat in the fermenter the whole time. As for aroma, getting a little bit of the chocolate malt and a little bit of the, the hops, I think. Let's, let's see what we've got with the taste. Oh, well the taste, it's definitely more hops than it is malt. It's certainly tasting that pretty distinctive character of Falconer's Flight in this. Mm, this is good. Mm, but but there definitely is a bit of the well, sort of the brown malt taste that you'd expect in a, in a regular brown ale just with some hops added too which honestly makes it an improvement over a regular brown ale if you ask me this is absolutely delicious now i didn't have my usual taste at lauren with me today but don't worry because in next week's special video you're going to be seeing quite a bit more of her see you then